This comedian roasted a bunch of bankers right to their face after being hired as entertainment. Did you say you've raised six thousand dollars for charity? No. What do you? People have done more than six thousand dollars of coke during this party. <laughs> six thousand? Look at yourselves. How much money do you guys have? People are making millions of dollars as I say this right now. This got weird immediately. This is a comedy show, so I'm gonna shit on you to your faces. Mostly because you look like you work at mid-level boutique banks. Not even... It looks... You look like you work at Moldus and Company. Oh, loosen up, guys. It's stand-up comedy at a charity event. We're gonna have to get on board. Thank you, one guy who runs the event. And... Everyone else is on a bunch of coke, so they're not really listening. They're like, business idea, business idea, business idea, business idea. Don't donate to the Bronx charity, business idea. I'm so sorry. I. What happens in the business is when you do this, you just don't get invited back. That's the only punishment you get. She's nodding. She's like, oh, I know. You won't be invited back. And I... I'm okay with that, to be honest. I love this, and maybe you like it too. I really think that things are shifting culturally in the United States, because when I was growing up and I was in public school, it was shameful to be in a family that didn't have a lot of money, to not have nice clothes, not live in a nice house or have a nice car. And I did not have good teeth. I had brown spots on my front teeth. We could not afford good dental care. And so I kind of wore my class on my face. And I always felt that shame and felt like I needed to hide it. I didn't smile for years. But now things are really different. I've noticed there's a resentment toward people who do have money. Now it's shameful to come from a family where you can't afford that stuff because it's like, you didn't have to work that hard. You had everything handed to you and there's a resentment there. That's a huge cultural shift. This cultural shift pretty much goes in tandem with wealth inequality growing in the United States. So this is the bottom 40% in 1983 and 2016. Not a lot of growth there. But here's what it looks like for the top 0.1%. They're growing their wealth tremendously. And they're not paying their taxes. So they're taking in way more money than we are and paying lower tax rates than us. The blue line here is the tax share of the top 0.1%. And the orange line is their wealth share. So they are not being taxed nearly as much as they used to be. And we really saw this shift under the Reagan administration. Let's look at the wealth concentration, how it spiked in recent decades. The orange bar is the average wealth of the people in the Forbes 400. And you can see that while the bar to entry has remained relatively the same, the people already there are growing their wealth a ton. We're not getting a lot of new rich people. Instead, the top 1% just keeps accumulating more and more money. Man, I really mean it when I say, long live Katie Porter. She's really one of my favorite women people in Congress, people in the whole government. I mean, nobody like her really holds people to account. I mean, of course you have some people, but she's just consistently, she grills people. And she does it so well. You know, there aren't any gaps in her persecution, she lets these people have it. You know, whether it be, you know, bank fraud or just general inequality within the economy, Katie Porter really, really is a superstar within Congress. And I think she has a very bright future ahead of her, probably within the Senate as well. She keeps on doing what she's doing. She's absolutely gonna have a great shot at getting into the Senate. Now she is in California, so that race may be a little tough. But again, she's just so great. And her popularity is going to continue to rise, not just with progressives, but also just with Democrats and just general people across the nation who see a woman standing up and really, really fighting for the public. We stopped buying the ETF several months ago. It was important to buy the ETF in order to jumpstart the general process of restoring the economy, which has benefited everyone. So what happened here is you said you wouldn't buy bank debt. Then you crafted a loophole or using ETF so the Fed could buy bank debt, a loophole buried in a subparagraph of rules on the Fed's website. And this loophole essentially swallowed up $2 billion in taxpayer money during COVID to bail out big banks, even as you told the public that the money could not go to any bank. I mean, what's one of the main thing that you see Republicans and conservative Democrats and people like Bill Maher you know what I'm saying? And the media talking about is how, you know, we just gave these huge giveaways to people, 
you know, the bailout money and stuff like that. And they talk about how they don't want people's tax dollars going to X, Y, and Z, you know, let alone the $10,000, $20,000 in student loan debt, the 10% to 5%, uh, you know, reform that Biden made on student loan debt. You know, those little changes, you know, oh, no, I don't want to pay taxes on that. But, you know, when taxpayers pay money, you know, to bail out giant airlines to, you know, save their employees and then those airlines fire the employees anyway so that they could, oh, buy their own stocks back. And then you have all these flights that, you know, oh, well, we're short staff. We can't make this flight. We can't make that flight. Well, didn't we give you guys money so that that wouldn't be the case? Ah, uh, yes, of course. You see, because the people who are in power, they can do whatever they want with our money. But when it comes to actually helping people, you know, where that money comes from, oh, no, 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 no. We can't go there. Now, luckily, as I've said many times, I think that going into the November elections, the 2024 elections and beyond, I think that progressives have more opportunity than we've had in a very long time to get better candidates into office and to get better policies passed, especially with the reversal of Roe v. Wade and the Republican Party just being totally and utterly insane. Joe Biden making marginal gains that are making him popular enough to where it's like, all right, we'd rather the Democrats than to give the Republicans another shot whatsoever. Again, that's really just opening the doors for us to get more candidates like Katie Porter into office. Because again, she's just so great. Imagine what the country would be like if we had 20 more Katie Porters in Congress, 30 more Katie Porters in Congress. That would make a huge difference. So let's make sure that we see the silver line and do what we need to do, get these better candidates in office so that we can get these policies passed to make this country and this world a better place.